And so it looks like we're ready to get started today. I want to welcome everyone to the October webinar present, uh, presented to you by the Underground Construction Association Young Members Group. My name is Shannon Goss, and I'm one of three members of the UCA of SME Executive Committee for the UCA Young Members. I'm the University Outreach Chair, and I'm joined by Anthony Bauer, the Chair, and Aaron Clark, the Professional Development Chair. Before we get into today's presentation, I have a few announcements. Uh, first, a few updates for our upcoming webinars. We typically hold our webinars on the last Wednesday of each month. We're mixing it, mixing it up a little bit next month, though, due to Thanksgiving. So please join us for our next webinar on November the 18th. Our presenter is still being organized, so keep a lookout for an email with the details. And as always, you can see the information for upcoming webinars, um, as well as register for them on the events page on our website. Please note that our November webinar on November 18th will be the last session this year, so be sure to check that out. And then we will resume our monthly series again in January 2016. Uh, second announcement, I wanted to make sure that all of the students joining us today are aware of the UCA of SME scholarship. Applications for this are due on December 8th, and there's a link for more information on our homepage. Uh, now moving on to today's session, we continue the webinar series with a presentation by Tammy Clays, a project manager for the City of Portland. Her presentation is on the Taggart Outfall Structural Rehabilitation Project, and she will be discussing the preliminary design for this project. Tammy holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Oregon State University and has 22 years of experience in the industry. She was the design manager for the City of Portland's East Side CSO Tunnel, which was a 22-foot diameter, six-mile-long board tunnel. She's currently working on enhancing and solving issues in the functioning of the larger Willamette River CSO system. With that, I'm going to turn control over to the speaker. Tammy, thank you very much for presenting to us today. And when you're ready, you can share your screen and begin your presentation. So the City of Portland, um, we finished our CSO system in 2011. And right now, what we are doing is we're looking at what we did right, what we did not so right, where we're headed. And the Taggart Outfall 30 project that I'm now working on is how the two intersect as far as what we didn't do right and what we're doing to fix it. So real briefly, the Willamette CSO um, tunnel system put two tunnels along the Willamette River on the east and west side. One is a 16-foot diameter, approximately three-mile-long tunnel, and another one is the east side, which is six miles long and 22-foot inside diameter. It's constructed. It's operational. We've met all of our mandated requirements as far as we've had no overflows that um, did not meet our federal mandate of uh, the storms that we were allowed to overflow on. We report um, yearly to DEQ, and like I said, that's the part that's going well. We built it to function well, and it's doing so. However, there are certain glitches that we did not anticipate in the design that we're going back to now and solving. What you have in front of you there is the tunnel system and where we have areas of concern. On the left-hand side is the west side tunnel, and the Balch Consolidated Conduit and the next shaft down, which is Upshur, we've had some transients and some venting issues. And then on the right side, on the east side tunnel, the Alder Basin has also had some transients and venting problems. And then just below that, you'll see the 30, and that's Outfall 30, and that will end the um, webinar discussion today. But we have both... Um, structural issues there that probably existed before, but we exasperated with the construction of the tunnel. So what we're seeing in that western portion, um, which is up in the upper left-hand side, is we're actually seeing transients. So we're getting some actual water hammer back that this is an example of a lockdown manhole in the system that blew and raised up the cone and took out some parking lot pavement and then settled back down. Fortunately, we saw this happened during the west side construction, so we still had time to construct a solution. 
So we modified some of our tunnel design by giving an opening to so the transient surge could release to the north. If you look at that diagram, the shaft was not to have a pipe connection left to the north. It was to be a closed system. We left that there in order we could have a weir overflow and the transient would have a place to release that that pressure wave rather than continue it up the system and theoretically to another manhole that we didn't know was going to explode. And then on the east side where we had the other problem, we have seen that we did not fully anticipate what would happen when we connected the existing system to the shafts. So we have these large shafts that we for the tunnel to, dis, to uh, excuse me, drop the tunnel, the, uh, excuse me, CFL flows into the tunnel. We get a very rapid rise in the shaft. So the water elevation, the hydraulic grade line is, wrapping, is increasing so rapidly through those shafts that it's actually pushing back into our existing system. The existing system is seeing a large storm out in the basin, which also is creating a large wave of water heading towards the tunnel, the two coming up from the tunnel, coming down from the system meet, and then we are getting, of course, the larger pushes from the tunnel, so we're getting hydraulic waves back into our existing system. In design, that probably should have been a consideration, but we did not anticipate that. Um, the other issue we're seeing is that we have an overflow weir to the river at elevation 18. So most of our connections, as you can see, this one here is at negative 9. We've got a wall of water sitting there if the shaft is full, the tunnel is full and the shaft is full and it's overflowing. So we've got a wall of water, again, meeting that incoming flow or backing up into the system. Sometimes it may not cause a transient because we, the flashiness of the storm is dependent upon the level of the transient, but still we've got a surcharging problem we created in a system that didn't necessarily have one before. Um, so there's our potential for transients that we did not identify in the initial design of the tunnel. The um, venting has been wit witnessed in the sense we've seen dancing manholes, we've seen uh, manholes displaced and blown off their rim. So we know it's happening. We're, and so now we're to the point of truly understanding the mechanisms that are causing that, the, the amount of pressurization that we're putting into the system, and solving them. Again, this is just a depiction of the shaft. So as you see, the system to the left brings flows in. We have the drop. The CSO tunnel is full. We've got the shafts rising up. There's nowhere for those connection pipes to drop water in. And very likely in some, or it has happened in some cases where that pressure wave goes back into the system or simply as the upper pipe shows, we begin to surcharge. So well, some of them are very simple solutions. One of them is um, it was more of a venting and air entrapment than it was a hydraulic transient. So in some cases where we can, such as this one, we have simply vented. We've built vents that will allow the air to be released. The tunnel can surge and we can get a little liquid, so that's why the vent is offset to the right, the lower diagram. So we'll let the, we'll let the, the venting carry some moisture with it, hit the roof, come back down into the tunnel system, and then the air vent to the right. And this is, works for us well where we can take it outside of the street where nobody will, pedestrians won't be impacted, such as to the upper right. This isn't a nice vegetated area that we could easily access and put such a vent in an industrial area. So basically what we learned um, is that if you're going to build a tunnel, we did the surcharging and the transient analysis for the tunnel system. We did not carry that back into the condu conduit system. So what we learned is if we have any large conduits where we are introducing a flow mechanism, 
then we should be modeling or at least aware of our ability to create the transient or the air entrapment and that uh, anytime we start moving discharge elevations of below where the relief point is, we may have a problem. We should spend a little more time looking for venting abilities and then um, look at what we're doing at our connection points. So that moves me into, I'm going a little off to the left to explain the city's asset management framework that takes me back into Taggart. So we spent 20 years and $1.4 billion meeting those CSO requirements, and we finished in December 2011 on time. But in that 20 years, we neglected much of our other pipeline work throughout the city. And so we needed to gain back ground. And to do that, we created our asset management system. This allows us to normalize, quantify, and prioritize where we need to be spending our CIP money to rehabilitate or replace pipes at the right time. We don't want to do it too early so that we're not using our funds to their maximum ability. We don't want to do too late so we get the failure. So since 2012, we have developed approximately 16 projects to be built over eight years at about the cost of $121 million, and that's an ongoing system. We're now moving into large diameter and using the same scenario, which we'll go into, but it's based on risk of failure, and which is composed of likelihood and consequence. So I'll step through this with lots of pictures. So the basis of the Portland's asset management, most asset management, is risk reduction, reduction by deferral of failure. So for our system, so the upper graph could be our system. It could be a pipe. It could be a pipe segment, which we'll go into. But what we've done is we've taken that risk of failure and we've distributed it over a bell curve over time. So somewhere in that time, the probability of failure or the likelihood of failure is shown. By repairing it, pardon me, I forgot one element. So then we'll bring that back into present worth risk. And then we will look at what it would mean for us to either rehabilitate it, do a spot repair, or replace it. And then we'll move that risk of failure back in time. And then as we bring the worth of that risk forward again to present worth, we've reduced our risk. So we've actually gone to the level of discretizing our segments of pipes. So a pipe seg, we do not deal in manhole to manhole. In the small diameter in the basin projects, which we're now invoking on, we have 10-foot segments. So we can normalize the grading score to a specific pipe. So we don't have one piece, one element of a pipe that blows it out of the water to be the highest priority. That 10-foot segment is, but the rest of the pipe is in good condition. So we normalize the grading score across the city by discretizing to 10-foot segments. It captures the innate failure mode also of the pipe. So we wouldn't replace the pipe if it was one point that's driving one 10-foot segment. We would do a spot repair. So, pardon me. So the, when we move pipes to 10-foot segments, we score each one by a 10-foot segment. So we have Hansen is our database that collects our CCTV and all our maintenance records. And we take our GIS and we go in and we marry the two databases so that we can make maps like this that show what every 10-foot segment, what the condition assessment is. We have a ranking of 1 through 5, which you can see below where 5 is red and is our worst condition pipe. Fours are orange, green, blue, etc. We will only look to repair grade four and five. One through three, we don't have the funds to address those, so we will leave those as an acceptable risk to the city that will be addressed later. As part of this, we've also integrated 
I'm going to go back one. So this is our likelihood. This explains our condition assessment when we think it will fail based on what its condition assessment is, the year it was constructed, and a number of elements. We will then look at what the consequence of failure, the COF, for each segment is. This is done through a, again, marrying of the Hansen maintenance database and our GIS system. So numerous lookups, numerous XP um, pipe type analysis. It will go in and look for whatever pipe segment we ask it to, where that segment is in relation to its street classification. If it's an arterial, the consequence of failure is larger. It's going to put more money towards the disruption of traffic. If there's a water line nearby, they're just going to look at its size and proximity. It's going to add more money to the cost of failure, both for the failure that we would cause the water line and for the amount that it would reconstruct the system. The depth of the pipe goes from our maintenance, and it's more expensive, of course, to fix a deep pipe. Other miscellaneous things, if there's environmental zoning, it'll add money and time for how much it's going to cost to get the permit, what the difficulties are. If there's a railroad, if there's a building nearby that's either in danger or will be impacted at the cost. So we'll take that consequence of failure. We'll use the remaining useful life to help us estimate what the likelihood of failure. So for those condition assessments, which I mentioned earlier, one through four, or excuse me, one through five. So if we had a condition assessment, of three, it will go over and it would say that it, um, it's an approximately 80-year-old pipe, so its remaining useful life is that 40 years, 80 to 120. So we, we've we used this curve. It's really a concrete curve, but it tells us how much remaining useful life, thereby what's our likelihood of failure. We expect that that pipe would would fail somewhere in a bell curve around that 120 years. And we do give a few more years to catastrophic failure, but that doesn't play too much into the actual calculation. So what we come out with, this would be a pipe run. And all the segments would be aggregated and their probabilities of their failure in that year aggregated throughout a pipe segment. So we'll get a distribution that shows where our most likely risk is in that pipe run. And you'll see this applied to the Taggart shaft um, a little bit later that makes this a little more useful. So as we decide what our consequence of failure is, we actually have a typical failure progression. So our initial failure is, is street fell in. So we calculate how many basement floodings that would cause if we collapsed a pipe. Typically on our small diameter pipes, we've got, we, calc we put a number in of four, and we give them $5,000 each. Then we've got a surface flooding problem that we need to clean up and anticipates what kind of street it was and what kind of traffic impacts we're having. And we usually calculate that we had a sinkhole also. And again, that's relative to where the sinkhole is, what the cost we attribute to that. We've got a stabilization um, to plate it, traffic barricades, start the bypass pumping so we can fix it, and then the emergency repair. And that may either be, for the small pipes, that may either be a whole pipe or a spot rehabilitation. And we approximate that as our typical cost of construction times a multiplier of 1.4. So for every failure, of every pipe segment, we calculate this so that we know what the cost for every segment would be if we fail. We assign those costs in your triple bottom line. So we have all these costs allocated according to economic, environmental, and social. And I won't go too much into that, but again, all those parameters are put into that calculation based on this triple bottom line. So taking that same likelihood of failure that we had for that pipeline, now we've attributed costs to it. 
So our consequence of failure, what the cost of the failure of that pipeline is, is shown, is depicted in the area beneath the probability of failure curves. So if we're looking at base risk, we've got our distribution of failure over time. Our money, our consequence of failure value shown underneath that. So that's our consequence. We bring all that, we add it, find that additive value and bring it into present worth. And that's our risk that the city is sitting on today if it does nothing and it lets that project and it lets that pipe fail. What we will look at as we determine which projects we move forward with is the alternative alternate risk. What's the value of that for its net benefit cost ratio? So we look almost all of our projects anymore, we evaluate for a net benefit cost ratio. So net benefit cost ratio must be positive in the first place. If it's negative, then we're spending more money than the risk the city is carrying. So if the project costs more, costs a million dollars, but if the pipe failed and it was only half a million, we wouldn't do it and it would have a net benefit cost ratio of zero. So in this place, we in this uh, slide, we've rehab the pipe. So we've got an initial project cost in 2015. Our consequence of failure is much less out in the out years and the likelihood because we've moved that project out into the future. We've moved that failure mode, excuse me, out into the future. So we bring all that, we still bring everything back to present worth and our NBCR is our 100 year present worth base risk the city's carrying minus all the 100 year present worth of the alternate risk because we still have risk of failure. We still have some risk. We may have left some basement flooding, um, say a 25 year basement flooding risk out there. So we, we could have left ourselves some risk divided by the project cost. So one, it has to be positive and then how much, um, how it compares to one alternative versus another, which one receives the higher NBCR tells us how the best way to spend our money. So I'm going to skip that one. We went over that. So now we're moving into, that's how we've done our larger, our smaller, base and wide, say 8 to 24 inch pipes as we're going to up to try and bring the rest of our system forward that we neglected during the CSO years. So the post tunnels, now we're looking at the rest of the system as I stated. And that system worked well for small pipes. We're now tweaking the NBCR paradigm that I just walked through briefly to work for large diameter pipelines. And I'm sorry, I'll go back one second. Um, this is done through the Taggart Outfall Project, and CH2M Hill worked very much in partnership with the City of Portland in creating the methodology to work through the paradigms. So we've used it on this project. It'll be tweaked a bit more and modified for later large diameter program that we have coming forward. But this took quite a bit of discussing, debating, and eventually determining a way forward. So much kudos to uh, CH2M Hill for working through the pain with us. So this is the Taggart outfall pipe that we're going to talk about briefly. Um, as presented, it's the Brooklyn trunk system. It's 7,600 linear feet of 66 to 120 inch brick sewer. The 120 is, of course, the lower system that outfalls to the river. It's our largest CSO out overflow point. It was constructed in the right-hand side. You can see it. There was constructed both as open cut and as a tunnel with three layers of brick and then a paver bottom. It's constructed in 1909 at a cost of about $250,000. It was the most expensive sewer the city of Portland has ever embarked upon up to that point. It was constructed to alleviate um, death and sickness, mostly from typhoid in the crowded inner east side of Portland. It carries in a 25-year flow about, excuse me, storm about 900 CFS because it ties into the largest CSO 
basins that the city of Portland has. So um, it's, a, it's a significant piece of our infrastructure and our CSO system. So in 2002, we started to embark upon this idea that we needed to rehab our system and in, or excuse me, 2012. So what came back from our large diameter CCT inspection program is that Taggart had some issues. So you can see we have some misaligned bricks. We have significant infiltration in portions. You can see the spring line that one we have some sort of joint there that's beginning to separate and a lot of mineralization along with some cracks in some of the portions of it in the ceiling, which you can see here, and again some mineralization around there showing that we are getting water into the system. It is underground water for about three quarters of the large outfall section. So briefly, um, this is where Tag Taggart Outfall is located in the city. As you can see, it doesn't follow streets um, necessarily for much of it. We're under buildings, partially in right of way, and then underneath, if you look to the very left, the actual outfall is under our Ross Island Sand and Gravel, one of our Ross Island Sand and Gravel facilities, which is a very large concrete producer in Portland and probably one of the the worst condition portion of that pipe is underneath that facility. Working towards looking at an NBCR for the Taggart outfall was both to validate its criticality, validate the $15 million that the city wanted to, had budgeted towards its repair, and then we would also use it to evaluate the alternatives that we came up with. So one of the issues we wanted, we saw all the infiltration, so we, and we had a condition assessment of the cracks in the CCTV, but we needed to take it one step further and determine what we had outside of the pipe due to the age and the infiltration and the methodology, which included open cut and tunneling of different portions of the outfall. So we hired a um, consultant to come in and do CCTV or excuse me, pipe penetrating radar along the pipe. Um, so we had, as you can see there, two by fours, and, and we put the sensors, and we walked the majority of the lower section in order to determine if we had voids outside the pipe. In some sense, we were happy to see that we didn't have as many large voids as we might have. We did find some 12 to 36 inches, as you will see below, um, and then a number of smaller voids, but nothing that led us to an immediate fix of a cavity that had been created through 100 years of infiltration. And some sections look better than others. You can see from the color coding there that we have now started to discretize the pipe. So instead of the 10 feet 10-foot segments that we used on the smaller pipes, we decided that a small pipe might might fail in a 10-foot segment. It's not a bad number. A large pipe of this size wouldn't fail in 10-foot segments. So we came up with discretizing our minimum size would be 50 feet. So as we analyze and step through Taggart, all of these segments are now 50-foot segments. And you can see now we've started to color code over where the condition rating, we've now incorporated both the CCTV cracks infiltration, we've now incorporated also what we found for voids and updated the condition rating based on both and now also discretized down to the 50 foot segment. So instead of manhole to manhole being a condition four, it 50 foot might be four, another 50 foot might be five, etc. So we can truly hone in on where we want to do these expensive fixes. So that's what we did to really update the condition assessment portion. The other thing we needed to do was update the remaining useful life curve. As I stated before, we had one that was developed for primarily concrete pipe. Brick sewers, much different. 
we didn't have a true remaining useful life curve that we could apply to the Taggart outfall. So CH did much of this work in looking throughout the nation, looking at brick sewers, looking for their condition rating score, where they failed, what the mechanism of failure was, and collected a number of data points. You can see the Taggart outfall is one of the data pipe points there with the arrow. They then, through an regression analysis, determined a new curve for this project. So this is different than the other curve, but this is what we developed as part of the in order to find a remaining useful life, which would give us the likelihood of failure for portions of the sewer, we needed to have a curve that represented the true mode of failure for brick sewers. So our, we, had, we left our condition rating scores. We actually kept those. Instead of 1 through 4, we kept them 1 through 100. We could go over to the intersection with the curve, go down a remaining useful life, etc. I just throw this up here again to see the difference between what you would see, what we were using for concrete. Here it's the slope. The deteriorate is, is slightly more linear than you would get in once you get to a brick sewer. The, rec, the uh, level of decay seems to be quicker at the tail end, which is what you would probably think. Once it starts losing its compression ring, it deteriorates more exponentially than you would see in a concrete. So that's just for comparison. So then we went back and looked, took that remaining useful life and plugged it back into each of our segments. And again, these are 50-foot pipe segments. So now we can discretize where we have issues. So now, instead of having 7,600 linear feet of pipe to replace and decide whether we do or not, we start getting measurements that allow us to determine where it's best to spend our money. I should also mention the $15 million we were given to repair this, if we repaired all of these sections that are shown here was original scope, we had not the funds to complete that, and we knew that. So we needed to determine where we needed to do the most work. So as you can see, we've got some remaining useful life in the red over here towards the left. Theoretically, from what we have found um, from CCTV and, P and the pipe penetrating radar, we think that that pipe has one to ten years left. That piece of red pipe there is underneath um, two businesses and would be very difficult to access if we did have that failure. Not to mention we would probably buy a building or two. The other thing we needed to look at was our consequence of failure. As I stated before, we had costs associated with a water line being nearby or that we were in a busy street or that we were near rail and we had more difficult construction. We did not have the type of cost that would be for a large diameter emergency repair cost, such as a wide, deep excavation to make the access shaft. Um, the high cost of bypass pumping. At no, that was a fairly minimal cost for small pipes. For 900 CFS, we know we can't pipe, we cannot bypass pump, but at least we need to put in enough money that somehow we find solutions to divert flows and do our and allow us to work in that emergency condition. And real briefly, you'll see we broke it up into three sections: the west reach, the east reach, and the south reach. And I'm going to try and step through some pretty pictures. So the other thing we determined is that we had, when a pipe failed for a small pipe, we like like I mentioned earlier, we had five basement flooding four or five basement floodings we would attribute to that. We realized when a large diameter pipe breaks, we could have a much, we have a much larger problem and even problems we don't consider with smaller pipes. So what we did was we went in and we broke the pipes. So I'm showing you the west here. So we broke the pipe where you see the yellow. Almost closed, we allowed some flow out. And we looked to see what would happen in that pipe. 
as you can see um, from the elevation ranges, we have a small pocket where the purple is outlined. It's a slight depression in the city. So that large pipe would back, excuse me, would back up into the, into the system. And then eventually, those red manholes show that we are overflowing those manholes. And the yellow ones are just starting to overflow. So we have backed up the system to the point of all those red properties are in risk of basement flooding. All the ones in black are all commercial, which are in risk of basement and business flooding. We have inundated the area in the purple with surface ponding. And we use that then to calculate the risk of, of the, excuse me, not the risk, the consequence of failure. So for that, we had 103 manholes that flooded and street cleanup and disruption, because there's also a highway in there, along with our heavy rail and our one of our light rails, which would all come to a halt because we were now flooding their ballast. So this was quite useful in seeing the extent of a failure mode for our large diameter pipe. Briefly, um, I won't go through these, we just did, but we did the same for the south. We had a much lesser impact as far as basement flooding. We didn't have that ponding because we didn't have that same bowl area that we were worried about. We had no heavy rail um, in the area. So much less consequence of failure at calculations. Again, did the same on the east. And again, you can see we had 209 residential basement floodings, but at $5,000 versus a business um, flooding, business commercial is more in the range of 50,000. We lessened our risk, we lessened, lessened our consequence of failure here also. So I'm just going to walk through the west reach a little bit. So we took that west reach scenario where we broke it, and we did all our triple bottom line, where we calculated how much it was going to cost to take that highway offline, to take the rail, the ridership off our light rail system, the base, the commercial, to pay the commercial people to pay our basement flooding, to do our emergency repair with some large shafts. And this is what we came up with. So just one 50-foot segment, if it failed, as an average, would cost us $10 million. And so a lot of that is the basement flooding, as you see because we're going to have to stabilize that area, area ASAP, especially with the brick that can unravel. So that gave us a lot of room to move forward with justification on the project. So we found our likelihood of failure by our remaining useful life. We then have a consequence of failure of $10 million for one 50 per 50-foot segment in the larger pipeline there. And now then we started doing, um, putting our risk over the number of years. And in doing so, I will have some. So in a 50-foot segment, this is a depiction of what that risk looked over that 50-foot segment, or what two 50-foot segments look like if they have different likelihoods. So you can see that we have that 50-foot segment, the area under in the black distributed equates to about the $10 million, because that's the area, the consequence of failure, sitting out there with a remaining useful life of approximately 23 years. So that's the center of our, that's driving the center of our bell curve. And then it's distributed out. Another segment was in slightly better condition or had fewer voids. So it's the green. And it has a remaining useful life of 43 years. And as you can see, the distribution is different. Because as we move out further in time, we're able to more, we have less certainty, theoretically, in when that will fail. There's more wiggle room, as you can say, in when it'll fail. So that's why you see the distribution curve looking different. But so we would just, we simply take all those segments, pile them on top of each other for that pipe run or for the entire reach, depending on what we're trying to analyze. And we come up with something like this. So this is an aggregate of the west in blue and the south in green. So this is the risk. So the actual likelihood of failure 
meaning the years that it has left, plus that consequence, which for the west side was $10 million per failure, and the south, I believe, was three. And so when you times those two together and then distribute them over time in present worth dollars, you see this was a big hello for us because almost all of our risk that we need to either address or carry in our CIP budget right now is in the, is in the West. I'm going to step through some more quickly. So this is, again, where we came up. This is that same same depiction except colorized where you can see that our risk, base worth of our risk, the yellows, the oranges, the reds, the higher risks are all in the west. We have very little on the east and the south. So we used that to step through rehabilitation locations. So we determined whether, based on risk and condition, whether we needed a whole pipe, rehab, which is in the green, a point repair could get us an acceptable risk mitigation in the yellow, or if we simply had a point repair that would get us out of the risk, that would take our risk far enough in the future that we didn't have to carry that, then that's shown in the pink. And we used this then to move forward in what we thought we could do for fixing the problem. So we brought in a two-day vendor workshop where various vendors came in for half a day and they came in and they gave us a brief presentation on how they would address the Taggart outfall and then let us ask questions about how, what's the design life, how, what is their pumping length that they need, what timeline do we need to cure, how much, how dry does it need to be, how clean, et cetera. It was, it was really informational and made everyone, city, the vendor, CH2M Hill, feel comfortable that everyone had at least a good base knowledge of why these decisions would be made in the future. So again, I just, there's our minimum locations as far as what we thought we had to do in order to meet what was needed to alleviate the high risk to the city. Developed a number of alternatives, everything from a high NBCR to a low NBCR to DC9 comprehensive, so we fix everything so we never have to worry about it again. What's the fastest way to get out there, out of the project area and get it done, et cetera? So then we needed, with NBCR, everything has to have a cost. So you have a number, any other project, you have a number of non-cross cost criteria, such, um, such as private property impacts, business impacts, which typically you can give ratings to or points to, but in NBCR, ECR, everything has to come down to a project cost. So we ranked these, decided what was important on these various criteria, such as environmental impacts, to public disruption, things that you typically deal with. And we needed to find ways to financially find, to find cost to those. So public disruption, we would actually assign a cost for every one of those concerns by the traffic impact costs, such as half an hour delay, how much is that worth to every car, and what is the traffic count on that particular street. Um, environmental impact, indirect cost of permitting. Um, we could add some time, but I don't think we did on this one. So we took all those elements and plugged them into a project cost, which was quite a lot of work. We also took those rehabilitation technologies and we applied what their remaining useful life. Because remember, we have to take those project costs and the remaining useful life, bring them together into a present value to compare. So different technologies had different remaining useful life. So we had to determine what those were, such as the epoxy injection and Brick repointing, of course, have 10 years or so. I mean, they're not expected to be long-term fixes versus a slip lining that would have 100. So we poured all of our work that we'd done on the likelihood of failure, making new curves, finding our PPR, PPR information, our consequence of failures, our flooding maps, and we did our 100-year present worth. We just went through how um, we came up with project costs. 
and we came up with the alternatives, the structural alternatives that, um, and we applied MBCR to them. So if you look at alternative one, we have a spray applied, meaning that we were looking both at a geopolymer or a shot creek, and we went through what the costs were for each, and then what our MBCRs were. So if you see on this one, we have high MBCRs because what we did is we stuck with the the whole pipe and the structural technology, um, the whole pipe repairs in the blue and just point repairs in the red because theoretically we don't have to fix that pipe completely. So you can see we have very high NBCRs of 23, 20, of 23, um, slightly less for the geopolymer due to the expense of the geopolymer. But looking at this, we also knew, now coming back to the original summation, is that we have an IE of approximately zero at the outfall. We have an overflow weir at ANR745 of 18. So we have now, we've now created this weir in the system that backs up the flow before it can overflow into the tunnel system. And that 18 was based on rivulet level. But right now we actually put a weir in that brick sewer that allows that big, long, flat brick sewer to serve charge in long storms. We introduced sewage charging into a brick sewer, and so we had to think to ourselves, do we really want to leave this sewer under buildings surcharging? So we changed the condition relatively soon. So we did develop the, um, the NBCR that would fix the entire system. So you see here, that's what we did. That entire blue is a whole structure pipe. Our NBCR went down less, because theoretically we're fixing some things that we don't need to, to about 18. And again, this is a tunnel. This is for our tunnel liner plate and our spray applied. We also did. Do you want to fix the whole thing? Because we know it's brick. We know it's in mediocre condition, but not as bad as we thought it was because of our assessment that we've done. Our NDCRs went down to nines and twelves. So this was a quick kind. This is a way of taking some of the subjectivity out of the decision on how much brick sewer you fix in your aging system to bring it into, these are the numerics that you get for your net cost benefit of how well you're spending your money. So this shows that we were bringing some of it too early. So where we did end up is this solution here, where we have, we're doing point fixes. On the west, we're, we're, we are going to do the entire reach. The two technologies that could be done according to um, according to the net cost benefit ratio and according to timeline, can we get it done in a season because of our large flows? The two that that actually and we didn't need the large access shafts came out with again spray applied, which is the geopolymer or a shot creek. We're still exploring both and a tunnel liner plate, old school. So. Um, We'll be looking on how we will design and leave those two in place so that the two uh, methodologies can compete, technologies can compete against each other for the best solution. I think, okay, I'm almost done. So for our outcomes, these were NBCR calculations for the various technologies. Slip lining. Um, Got a lower NBCR a lot because of, it was great because you could do it in the large flows, but the ability to put in large shafts in order to make that happen in that congested urban area and the amount of disruption that would cost brought down the NBCR. Spray applied, as you discussed, did well. CIPP, the same thing, would take some size shafts and the risk of doing a 120-inch sock um, also brought down the overall NBCR. Um, there's also some things such as permitting and public involvement due to the styrene and other issues that were calculated into that. Tunnel lighting plate, like I said, old school, came out well due to the fact that uh, minimal shaft and public disruption, the robustness, um, the longevity of the, de of the design life um, did well. Flip form also did well but we came down and took the top two to move forward with, spray applied and tunnel line plate, and our movie and preliminary design. Um, 
doing some finite element analysis and starting to configure through those curves and some of the other difficulties that we have on the project, finding access points and then bringing it into design. So what we came away with is the depth of the sewer, which is at times 70 feet, and the need for access shafts for those larger or those other technologies was difficult to get past in the NBCR. Surcharge events um, did require all of these to meet a pressurized condition design. Um, the flows and bypass pumping costs nice, um, increased the time and construction and were quite a driver in the consequence of failure scenarios that we had in place when we decided the cost of a failure. And again, the rapid installation costs or the rapid install times of some of the uh, methodologies that we were looking at, because we did look at things like uh, carbon fiber, fabric, and um, some other methodologies that took longer and had more people in the pipe, thereby inducing risk, were also uh, actually calculated into the NBCR. So I think what we did was monetize as much of those elements into the project selection as we could, and we came out with not what we were expecting and maybe not what we would have without this tool, but we um, validated that where we need to spend the money for the city, where the city believes that uh, the money needs to be spent, we'll get a look and we'll get some additional funding based on the risk analysis and what we want to move forward to on technologies. And again, I left CHKM Hill also on this because they did a very large portion of that work with us. And thank you for listening to me. Tammy, thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, I haven't seen questions come oh, in yet. You. I haven't seen questions come in yet, so I'd like to invite all of the uh, attendees to please use the chat panel to submit any questions for Tammy that you may have. And Tammy, while they're doing that, are there any closing statements you'd like to make? I have found this webinar a nice opportunity for me to think a little bit outside the box and think about how I have been. One of the nice things about being a civil engineer is being able to grow one piece of work into another. And I think that's a, that's a nice key to have as you work through your projects instead of thinking of one project to another to another, is how to make a storyline of what you've done and where you want to be and what you want to create with those past experiences. So that was, it, that was a nice learning piece of information in, in putting together this presentation. And, you know, the East Side Tunnel was definitely out of my scope of I had never done anything quite that big yet. And I'm really happy that I just said, with help, I'll do whatever you need. And it was a really growing opportunity for me, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. And I'm glad that I jumped in with both feet and, depend and worked with other people who were more experienced who would let me ask question after question after question until they were just tired of me, but they would just let me do it till my mind was full. and. It was great. Use the people that you have on your side who want to help you also succeed. That's wonderful. I'd like to go ahead and remind our attendees um, that we really appreciate you joining us today. And we are recording today's session. So we'll have that available on the UCA Young Members website within the next 48 hours. And we'll send you an email letting you know when that video is posted. Um, Tammy, we did get a, a thank you and appreciate the presentation, but it doesn't appear that we have any questions at this time. So since we're at the top of the hour already, um, that went by so quickly, <laughs> I'd like to thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it was very informative, very interesting, so much detail to it. Um, I'd like to invite our attendees to join us November 18th um, for our next webinar for the UCA Young Members. Again, check the website for uh, details on that next speaker. Um, and we'll go ahead and end today's session. But thank you, Tammy, so much. This was such a great presentation. Thank you for the opportunity.